DMT, both NN and 5-MeO on brain EEG, electrical activity. I was uh, working with salvia divinorum, another very potent uh, psychoactive. And so I kind of perfected the technique with salvia, you know, how you can get the recordings, what do you need to, to do exactly? And so that was a really good preparation for DMT because it just segued right into working with this, these magic molecules. So uh, I'm going to give a talk uh, following this on my findings and share uh, where that work is going and, and give a, another sort of an overview of psychedelic brain science. Very exciting and uh, where that is and uh, I'll be uh, around to uh, discuss and answer questions. So, thanks. Hello. Um, my name is Dr. Jack Alocca. I'm a, a neuroscience research fellow at Ponte the University of Melbourne in Australia. I'm a neuroscientist, a, a pharmacologist, as well as a, an engineer. I work mostly on um, trying to unravel the uh, electrical dynamics in terms of EEG of um, the psychedelic state and more um, broadly altered states in general. So my, my most focused interest has been on consciousness and all the ways one can alter it with or without uh, chemical interventions. And of course my interest has uh, spanned many compounds so far and uh, encountered uh, Buffo virus eventually in 5-MeO DMT, so I, I work on uh, data mining uh, EEG recordings from um, a variety of, um, of compounds, uh, both psychedelic and non-psychedelic in, um, in academia and for drug discovery. And uh, just later I'll, um, I'll be speaking about the toxicology and pharmacodynamics of, uh, of the secretions of Buffo virus as well as a, a bit of an evolutionary biology account of what may be going around this uh, wonderful creature. Thank you. Hello. Whoa. Let's be gentle here. My uh, name is uh, Dr. Michael Villanueva. I am a clinical psychologist, and I want to stress that because I have a scientific background. I was a professor at the University of New Mexico and worked under NIH funding for a while. But first and foremost, I'm a clinician, and I got involved with this unexpectedly, especially being an ex-Army psychologist, when I had a client that I sent to Crossroads. And this client, I did a pre-Q or EEG reading and did a post, and it was like, okay, this is impossible. I've worked enough with the brain to know that you do not get this type of change in 76 hours. You, you just don't but it was staring me in the face. So I started exploring it more and more in frustration. And then at the age of 60, I had my own experience down in, um, down in Mexico with Sandra. And, oh, thank you. And that just, um, well, what it does for a lot of folks, it activates 16 to 17, 18 hertz, and that's a real driving motivational can be frequency. And I steeped myself in studying and research, and that's how I ended up here. And I'll be talking about some of the data I've gathered in Costa Rica and Mexico and Australia, as well as some of the real specific techniques that we have evolved to extract the EEG signature from highly kinetic states. Those of you that have done five know that it can be pretty physically volatile. And there's ways of that we've learned how to get really good information out of that. So I'm looking forward to participating in science, my good doctors. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all. <clears throat> One thing that's really striking um, about this molecule, for me, when you look in the, the peer-reviewed literature, there's very little science on 5-MeO. It's really in its infancy, perhaps a bit like this conference. Um, we're at kind of ground zero with, with what's happening. And um, I think this is an, a really exciting time and a lot of us are doing what I kind of call like guerrilla research where we're, we're not in the ivory tower, some of us are and we have worked in those contexts. Um, but a lot of this is like Dr. Juan or Dr. V going out into a, a ceremony with Octavio or Rack out in the jungle or out in the field and hooking people up to 
you know, EEG equipment or giving people questionnaires as they're coming out of states and same at, at Crossroads in a way. We were just kind of this small clinic. And um, you all are kind of pioneers in this way uh, with, this, with this medicine. So there's, in the literature, if you look, there's uh, a few animal studies. There is an interesting um, proteomic study that came out uh, in the last year um, where 5-MeO is given to, uh, applied to human cells in vitro, but there, there are no uh, human studies yet, controlled studies. And uh, if we could maybe just share from the work that you have done, you're, you're all going to be talking later, but perhaps some, some nuggets or some summary points of the work that you have been doing, what would be helpful for, for our audience today with uh, people that are practitioners, facilitators, recipients, psychonauts, what are some of the, uh, the juicy findings that you, you found so far in your, in your work? Okay, I, and I'm going to start by saying I, I've reviewed everything I could find on 5-MeO-DMT, and there's 50 years of research on this molecule, and most of it was in the 50s and 60s. They were studying schizophrenia, and it was a model for schizophrenia. So they were taking urine and blood samples from schizophrenics and finding that they had different levels of DMT than non-schizophrenics and all that. So, and then all that was stopped when you know, the Controlled Substances Act came into play. And then there are animal studies, and some of those are really good. And then recently, as you mentioned, there are some wonderful studies on uh, immunologic and immunoprotection properties and inflammation. Uh, Zara is, is one of the pioneers, and he has a, a paper that's called 50 Years of 5-MeO-DMT Research, which I have, and it, it lists all the references. And, you know, the molecule was um, synthesized in 1936, so it's been around a while. <laughs> um, my nugget, um, I have been looking at altered states under EEG, very much like my colleague here, and I've explored meditation, kundalini activation, um, you know, pranayama, breath work, um, psychedelics, variety of things, and gamma. These are the high beta frequencies. They all share increases in gamma, so that's what I'm excited about. I'm actually writing a chapter on that for uh, this book that I've published already last year. And uh, definitely uh, DMT, both NN and 5, get you into high gamma. And gamma is a very nice place to hang out. It's sort of a, it's a high level of consciousness, you know. Uh, it, was, it's, it, it was first demonstrated in, in uh, Tibetan Buddhist uh, studies, uh, Richie Davidson's work. So compassion, a uh, higher level of uh, <clears throat> consciousness attained. And so, and uh, the other finding is increased um, connectivity in the brain measured as what we call coherence. And so that's a very consistent finding uh, with my EEG studies. And that means that new circuits, functional circuits in the brain are becoming activated. So this is... 5-MeO and NN, but we'll focus on 5, is definitely like a reset button. It shuts off some parts of the brain and activates other parts of the brain, and that's why we, we drop into, I, I like to call it, the soul consciousness. <laughs> yeah. um. <clears throat> cool. Uh, well, this is not working. So I'm just going to... Well, a little bit. Okay. So, um, okay. Well, bufovirus is definitely more than just 5-MeO-DMT. So it's, uh, it's quite interesting to see the, the, the incredible cocktail that this animal secretes. Um, one of the most interesting things I have seen, and in fact, this is kind of redundant because it will be in my talk just later, is that um, uh, bufotenin seems to have more of an effect than people think. And um, that can synergize with 5-MeO-DMT and create quite a unique um, experience. Um, but otherwise, without repeating things that will be later, 
uh, the level of the EEG, um, 5 mu DMT is quite interesting because it is, from a bird's eye view, a psychedelic compound, but with some respect, some of the effects actually mimic, to some extent, a bit more dissociative, which is quite rare with, with just the serotonergic-based compounds. And this is something we've seen with gamma a great deal because the same thing actually occurs with ketamine. And um, in many ways, 5 uh, dmt can both um, increase connectivity but also decentralize the brain. So the, the entire brain now seems to be processing everything while before uh, there's very uh, specific regions that do very specific things. Well, with 5 mu dmt the whole brain now becomes a decentralized mess of entropy that uh, just shuttles, shuttles information in every single direction. And um, that is definitely unique and uh, quite insightful. And we still have to work out what that actually uh, do uh, in terms of a day-to-day -day, um, dynamic. But otherwise, that's uh, definitely very profound. And uh, yeah, and well, I'll uh, I'll let you describe a bit more some of the things you thought in terms of EEG. Well, you were asking about the what was the question? <laughs> Nuggets from the work. <laughs> Nuggets from the work. Yeah, right. Talk about Delta. Um, talk about Delta later. My, my work's kind of gone in a little bit of a different direction. Um, there is a enamoring with gamma. So, you know, I have to be an outlier and say, so what? Um, snails make gamma. Parkinson patients make gamma. Making gamma is not the be all. What happens, what, I, what we're being seen in the brain when these power levels and, and waveforms shift is that it's, um, it's information transfer, and this is a pretty technical topic, and I'm not going to go into it, but unless gamma is nested within certain frequencies, unless it chirps, and there is a timing between the chirps, if it doesn't do that, you have madness and chaos, and I mean that literally. I have recordings of people that really were losing their shit. And um, we, had to, we had to stop the recording, but when we looked at the power distribution and what the waves were doing, it was, they were plummeting, it was chaos, and nobody was making sense. So you can have a brain lit up, but if it's full of noise, you're not gonna function real well. And the, the magic that we are seeing as far as a nugget is that the magic of consciousness appears to happen in the silence. And that, I think, is the biggest mystery. Because that's really what we're seeing, at least in the work that we've decoded, is that it is in this silence and almost no power that something really mis mystical is happening. And that's what really has intrigued me. As far as from a clinical perspective, um, one of the things that I've been extremely interested in and I'm, as a nugget for providers is that we've been looking at the EEGs of people who did not do well. And there are some very unique neurophysiological signatures. I'm sure Juan will, Dr. Juan will appreciate this. It looks like in each of those ones that they are not doing well afterwards, where integration takes days, if not months, the anterior cingulate is basically offline, especially the emotional processing area of the anterior cingulate. In the EEG, we think we can go way deep in the brain, and reality is we can't. But we can get to some areas, and the insula looks like it's being impacted in a really, I don't like it to say negative because that, those words don't work in the brain. The insula is not doing the job that we expect it to do. So there are really unique neurophysiological signatures on people who don't do well. And that's why I raised the comment, I think, about you know, people blaming the victim with intention or their heart wasn't pure. Um, that's really unfortunate. People with localized brain injury, and we really can see that. Um, um, I'm, I know Jack's encountered that problem. I know Dr. Wan's encountered that. You can see localized brain injury. They tend not to go do well. The mystery, though, is that thousands of people have gone through this, especially at crossroads in different clinics, addicts and people with major brain injuries, and they've done really well. So my nuggets are more like um, pieces of disintegrating clay. They don't kind of hold up under scrutiny. <laughs>
Yeah, no, this is definitely very insightful because both the uh, anterior cingulate and the insula are integrating centers for many other pathways that bring together uh, sensor information from the body with uh, the cognitive processing of what that may mean for the individual at the level of um, body awareness, processing of pain, danger, emotional salience. So especially the anterior cingulate, it's very important in limbic circuits to uh, process the affective component of uh, the human experience. So if that gets tuned either up or down, it is very likely that many disruptive uh, emotional uh, loops may start uh, kicking in. And the insula is very much a cornerstone of the salience within pain. So it's the insula that actually, amongst many other regions, but the insula is very cardinal in uh, giving nociception, meaning the carrying of um, uh, potentially tissue damaging information from the body, um, giving it uh, the painful connotation. So people that uh, suffer strokes at the level of the insula develop a very interesting condition called asymbolia for pain, where basically they, they feel pain but they don't care because they no longer feel it as painful. So they can process things like um, threatening uh, stimuli. So you know, like a few years ago, maybe a few decades ago, uh, actual scientists threatened to slap patients and whatnot and, and, and kick them in the face. And the sort of things that you do as a scientist a few years ago when science used to be even more, even more fun. And, uh, and patients would just completely fail to respond to it. They would smile and they'd say, oh yeah, what's going on? And, and uh, they, they would trip while walking because they wouldn't care about you know, appropriate balance. They would just not really care about danger in general. And, and so, you, yes, if a compound can act both at the anterior cingular and the insula, you probably see uh, extremely wacky stuff happening. And, and uh, I would definitely um, envision the um, uh, traumatic experience arising from, from this. So. Yeah, 5-MeO-DMT is a very powerful compound for a lot of resetting at the level of information, but it can also prime the brain for very profound trauma. So 5-MeO-DMT uh, can definitely make and it can definitely break. So that definitely stresses a level of responsibility around the use of it. Mm. <coughs> it's very interesting. Um, <coughs> Last year, I was working with a clinical psychologist in the Bay Area, and she was bringing her patients, and we were doing 5-MeO-assisted therapy. I would uh, provide the medicine and uh, keep it safe, make it like a sacred ceremony, and then sit and watch her work with the patients. If you work with a moderate dose, you can do this. And my observation, I'm not a psychologist, and was 5-MeO-DMT brings out dr uh, trauma, you know. A lot of these patients had PTSD issues and they come right up to the surface. So it's a very potent uh, agent to elicit this and to bring up, you know, uh, subconscious material that's been really buried deep. The psychologist, these are her clients, so she works with them ongoingly and she does all the follow-up and the integration. My job was just to bring the medicine and to sit and watch that everything went smoothly. The uh, population of subjects, brave subjects that I have hooked up to my EEG equipment, to my knowledge, have all been um, free of any uh, mental disorders or mental histories, although I don't know because I didn't really dig in deep. And um, what struck me was there's a fair amount of consistency in the data, the results. I have now over 20 subjects. I think I have 22 now for Bufo 5-MeO-DMT. Recently, I've been exploring synthetic 5-MeO-DMT because uh, critics can always say, well, the Bufo medicine contains other alkaloids in there, and so you've got this cocktail, and maybe these effects are not just due to the five molecule, but there's other stuff in there. And to my delight and surprise, the effects are exactly the same. 
So I'm really studying the 5-MeO-DMT molecule effect. The synthetic, um, I've had a run of four subjects recently, and some of them showed some pretty new stuff, too, that I hadn't seen before, like alpha peaks splitting into different components and um, things like that. But I'll get more into that in my talk. <coughs> I would follow up on the uh, responsibility of uh, of doing uh, providing the upual various uh, uh, secretion. Um, I was looking on uh, on the symptoms uh, of depression, anxieties, and somatization, and also on uh, on psychological factors as uh, resilience or uh, flexibility as uh, being the the very important uh, psychological uh, like mental health correlates. And I might not uh, satisfy uh, many of, uh, of really big fans of, uh, of those medicine because uh, the results show that, uh, yeah, most of the people really significantly improve. Uh, but about one third, and, uh, and in uh, some measures even more, people significantly worsen. And, uh, I'm, uh, I believe that it can be also just a transitory state. It was uh, measured after one month. And uh, yeah, also from the psychotherapy, the psychotherapy research, uh, we know that, uh, that when we start to dig into our things which we were suppressing all our life, that uh, then it can be really difficult when everything appears and, uh, and told medicine can uh, have this power that just manifests all that what we were just hiding for, for many years. But at the same time, uh, it's a reality that many people uh, are going through the difficult process. And uh, I had also the experience that uh, the people were asking for help, and I didn't know much what to tell them. I could recommend them some psychotherapies, but then I, I could see that some people need more. And I was like, but where I can send them? Uh, to the psychiatric hospital, but it's not going to help them. Maybe it can make them just worse. And uh, so I think uh, that we should uh, focus also like, on, uh, on really um, developing the, the whole social and, uh, and mental health care system for the psychiatric users and thought users so, uh, so, uh, so yeah, everyone gets the care they need. Most uh, also, yeah, I think uh, that still the, the results are pretty, uh, pretty great from my uh, point, uh, point of view because uh, there was no uh, like proper psychotherapy, uh, psychotherapeutic preparation and uh, follow-up. <coughs> and also from the psychedelic research uh, in the 60s and nowadays, uh, most of the researchers uh, agree that psychedelics as they are, are not therapeutic uh, agents, that they should be used in a, in a proper context. And uh, the psychotherapeutic one was, uh, I think, is often considered as, uh, as being the, the one of the best or most uh, suitable uh, to, uh, to, really, mm, to really provide the, the healing to the people. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think this brings up a really um, important point about this medicine that with, there's the psychological piece and then the neurobiological piece and um, Effectively, when you're giving someone 5-MeO, you're kind of taking the lid off all the trauma in their body, um, more potent than any other psychedelic, um, pretty much instantaneously. And I like what you said, Michael, about uh, there's sometimes in the shamanic culture, it's easy to blame the person if they continue to have persistent difficulties. Oh, you know, you you weren't ready or it was premature or you're not doing something right or you're not meditating hard enough or whatever. But we do know from enough kind of anecdotal evidence that there's just people that have really, really rough times after this, persistent reactivations, PTSD from the medicine. Um, and at the same time, uh, we published uh, with Alan Davis and a group, an epidemiology paper of 500 people that reported using this medicine and somewhere between like 60 to 70 percent of people with drug addiction, alcoholism, depression, anxiety all said 5-MeO helped them. But there's uh, proportions of people who said it made them worse and one of the clusters of those were people with um, obsessive compulsive disorder and um, That would explain the anterior cingulate. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> well, yeah, so I want to get into this. So uh, there, there's certain reasons why, there's certain groups of people 
this may be the worst medicine to give them out the gate as a, as a first-line psychedelic. It would be just uh, bad on all levels, essentially. Uh, and with OCD, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a neurotic condition where people's psyches are very tightly wound. Their control strategies are, are maxed out. And, and uh, Michael's saying there's a, a brain region. So I wanted to ask the panelists, um, what do you see both as the, the therapeutic benefits perhaps psychologically and also uh, neurobiologically, and then also some of the potential risks uh, uh, that we need to look out for. And the, the neurobiology of 5-MeO is, is amazing as well. It has all these uh, regenerative properties, these effects on, on sigma receptors that have implications for pain and, and inflammation. And there's a lot of physical healing that happens with this medicine. There's some suggestion of some anti-tumor effects with this medicine. So let's talk a little bit. I know the EEG data also, when people are on this medicine, essentially their, their frontal lobes die <laughs> uh, in, in a way. They go, they go offline in terms of the, the electrophysiological function. Um, <laughs> so let's, let's, talk, let's talk about this. What, what are the therapeutic potentials of this and also some of the potential pitfalls, risks that you've seen? I wanted to make a comment about the neurophysiology. Until the fMRI studies are done, we don't really have a very good <clears throat> overall picture of all the brain dynamics and all the changes. And at, as we speak, uh, the group in London, Imperial College, is doing NNDMT fMRI work. And I know some of the folks involved in that study, they're doing injected, you know, several doses, I met one of the subjects who's going to get into the fMRI tube and, and trip on DMT while his brain is getting scanned. Um, with EEG, you can now look at the sources inside the brain and circuits. There's software that allows you to do that. So that's kind of where I work, and that's, there's some limitations. The anterior cingulate cortex is part of a important hub of the default mode network. And it's involved in many, many uh, functions. And one of them is attentional selectivity and flexibility of assigning resources to other parts of the brain. So yeah, the OCD work, that's fascinating that uh, you've, you've, you've found that. As far as the frontal lobes going offline, I don't exactly know what that means. I, I never see my EG go flat. <laughs> it's, uh, it's full of information there, and um, so we need to clarify what, what exactly that means. Uh, yeah, well, uh, whenever any brain region goes flatline, uh, you, 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 you've run into trouble, and it may, may never go back to anything other than flatline. So. Uh, yeah, so that's not what happens. Um, there's a selective hypofrontality occurring with the 5 myodinti meaning that certain hubs within frontal regions and most selectively within the prefrontal cortex go down, which then disrupt the rest of the default mode network. Well, uh, in this in, uh, in theory seems interesting and, and, um, and helpful since uh, the default mode network uh, controls a great deal of uh, internal rumination and autobiographical um, replay of many programs which keep us alive, but very often also keep us stuck in, um, in schemas. Uh, there's a specific problem with 5-MeO DMT. Um, I am myself excited about seeing what happens with the fMRI uh, studies, but at the same time also very skeptical because Mm, for this specific tool, I do prefer EEG because it's still relatively uninvasive and, uh, and relatively inconspicuous. I would definitely stress the relatively. But uh, fMRI studies are very insightful, but they're also very misleading, because especially with psychedelics more than anything else. Because first and foremost, it's a very slow um, imaging technique. So it's like uh, taking a photo of, um, of, uh, of, of, uh, of the stars. You know, you would keep your shutter open for a very, very long time until enough information comes in. And that's what happens with, with MRI in general. You have to wait. So you, we don't really know the progression of the thing. We just get this, this overall image 
across many, many minutes. And that's just one thing. The other thing is that I'm not sure if any of you has ever been inside an, an MRI machine and and uh, stressing the importance of set and setting for a psychedelic experience. Great place for I a ceremony. I, 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 I would definitely be very curious to see uh, what, what would happen to, to something as, as profound as 5-Mio DMT in something as hellish and, uh, and absolutely, I don't know, it's literally, uh, it's basically a bad trip machine when you... When you when you look at it, it's uh, it's almost impossible to have uh, a solid oceanic boundlessness within an FRI machine. And if you do, you, you're definitely an outlier that should not belong to the study. And so yes, the MRI uh, technology is insightful. With psychedelics, I definitely thread carefully. Um, at the level of default mode network um, and OCD and all this potential uh, contraindicated pathology for the study of 5-MeO-DMT, there's definitely a problem with the whole uh, dynamic because the brain doesn't necessarily like to change and it does all sorts of things to keep boundaries at the level of homeostasis just like any other organ in the, in the body and um, to preserve certain pathways that to some degree preserved survival, so it does make sense. So whenever the default mode network goes down, and we see this with 5-MeO DMT as well as many other psychedelics, yes, the ego uh, dissolves, um, all these things, the identity goes down, but then the brain doesn't quite forget what happened, homeostasis kicks in, and what we see with psychedelics in general is that, well, ego goes down acutely, it then gets strengthened afterwards. Uh, which is actually a problem in many ways because um, many of the constructs that are um, healthy and unhealthy disappear but then they come back with a vengeance. So uh, for maladaptive circuits that is definitely a problem and uh, for psychedelics in general that is something we have observed with the seasoned uh, psychonauts, and this is something that uh, even uh, even myself I have to deal with, considering the the aggressive regimens I put myself through. Um, that in many ways the ego disappears, but then it comes back, and and this has definitely led to the demise of uh, psychedelic practice all up to the 60s, where many of the um, sanctioned psychedelic scientists themselves eventually developed uh, the biggest egos we can imagine with first and fo first and foremost the uh, the the the, the, <laughs> the, uh, the evangelized and demonized the Timothy Leary so uh, we we have to we have to be careful because psychedelics are not a panacea like anything else so if something is really bad they may come back even stronger and stronger and stronger and more validated and more confirmed and strengthened so this may explain a lot of what happens in the third to third plus that responds very badly to 5-MeO um, DMT and other psychedelics because if you don't provide the right um, care around the experience, uh, most notably uh, an appropriate uh, psychotherapeutic uh, regimen from a practitioner, then you basically leave the patient to psychoanalyze and psycho um, treat uh, him, him or herself. Uh, which may help, w may work for some, but for others it may just plunge them back into their own madness. So um, th th that stresses the need for psychedelic assisted th psychotherapy more than just giving somebody a, a drug. Um, because with 5-MeO DMT you remove th the schemas and then you go back to you know source information and you know, we can get into the metaphysical and whatnot, but then somebody is completely blank. There's just bleached with information. And uh, if you don't provide a, a way to tweak the schema that is removed, uh, the scheme eventually will just come back and, and uh, actually stronger. And the job of changing the schema in many ways is the job of the uh, psycho, um, psychologist or psychiatrist or practitioner or shaman or whoever is there to provide some sort of um, ecosystem around the, pati the patient or, the, or the, the subject. So that's very important and that's why we can't just treat buffal virus as a cure for, for everything. The person that is there to give the experience is potentially uh, at least half of the of the, if not more, 
of the experience. So uh, that is definitely an imperative. And we need to work more and more on trying to um, create a, a more organic and wholesome um, approach to such a potent intervention. Yeah. Yes. Mike, I want to see if you could speak. What I said, 5-MeO uh, kills the frontal lobes, which is uh, not in any way the right terminology, but essentially there is hypofrontality that happens. The frontal lobes lower well, in function. What do you mean by hypofrontality? In terms of there's a, a reduction in frontal lobe activity. Uh, and yes and no. And wha this is one thing I wanted to ask, too, is uh, we talked about people that might have uh, brain vulnerabilities in terms of might be sensitive to having blood flow reductions in the brain. Um, and you, you and I talked about a case. Uh, yeah, there was that case, yeah, a while back. Um, yeah, share your thoughts about that. First, well, I can share thoughts. I don't, I'm just not so certain I can share any knowledge because it is an incredible state of flux. There's different types. First of all, I'll talk about the OCD thing for just a little bit. But in my clinical experience, if you get somebody, this is an area called FZ, it's a standardized location, it's, that's what it is. Um, if you get somebody that is pumping out five, six hertz in a very almost a um, kurtotic distribution, it's very narrow, almost invariably, and you see this in kids, you see this in adults, and you see this in political leaders, which, which if I say, I don't agree with you, it isn't just a disagreement, it touches a visceral emotional level. That type of, those projections actually go literally into the limbic system. And we saw an example of that yesterday, where if there's a disagreement, then this is an emotional reaction and it's to the point where it's a matter of life and death. I have not seen 5-MeO touch that bad boy, ever. I, I just haven't, but I don't have the experience you all have. And I think that's a, that's a very strong, because then, you, then the practitioner thinks, well, I just have to break through, like the old Doors song from the 60s, right? Break on through to the other side. You know, at what point do you take a sledgehammer to the brain? I mean, this is ludicrous. This is, this is not, I think, how we should be using this, this, this medicine. The other area where we are incredibly ignorant about is the metabolic demand on the brain and what regions. Some regions are impact. It takes a lot of metabolic energy to produce low frequency. Low frequency, high energy. High frequency, low energy. And so to produce five, six, seven hertz, which is what the brain tends to make sometimes in different states and when it's bruised, requires a lot of metabolic energy. So if you're taking an area that's bruised already, that its natural humming background frequency is five, six, seven hertz anterior cingulate, and then you put a metabolic demand on that region, you're, you're gonna cause an ischemic discharge. You're gonna, you're gonna cause some type of, of oxygen reduction to that area. And then we're gonna get, which was what I think is what happened in that case we were talking about, that Rack was involved in and just a while back, and whether it's true or not, nobody will ever know. So we don't know. And, and so you're left with, well, where do we go from here? And I don't have any good answers for that. And the, thing I, the last thing on this frontality thing, because I think this came from the talk I was doing. Um, in the research that we've done, we use different ways. And the, the problem with EEG research is that you have to understand, and I'm going to talk about this, and I'm going to say it out loud right here, the EEG is not a signal. Let's be clear. It is an epiphenomenon. It is not a signal. It is like listening to the hood of your car with a stethoscope. That is not a signal. So it might reflect information, but it doesn't mean it carries information. And this is a very difficult construct for people to get. If you feed that sound back to your car engine, the transmission's not gonna get better. And neural feedback, which I do, the brain is a dynamic organization. It seems to be affected by that, but it is not a signal. And so the, what we're looking at in the brain are these locations, and we are listening to electrical activity. And so it becomes very restricted on what we can deduce from that. 
And one of the things we can deduce is what's called Shannon information um, theory and entropy transfer. And we can use something called Granger causality. Because in Granger causality, it, it's like one seems to precede another in time. And the data that we have on the frontal lobes is that it's almost as if the frontal lobe is talking to different nodes in the brain. And do you mind if I do this? Put my hand? So put your, good. Yeah, good. put your hand over my mouth. <laughs> and try to talk. <laughs> What's up, Doc? That's what we see literally in the brain, is mutual inhibition. So it's not shut down. It's not trying. Thank you. <laughs> good, good couples therapy. Science. It's all in the eye of science, but it's... It's striking because 5-MeO causes areas to actively not talk to each other. It'd be like if Juan and I were sitting next to each other and we're both trying to stand up, we're both trying to make each other sit down. That's what we can learn from some of these tools, but then we need philosophers to say, well, this might be what this is, because I have no clue, and I'm pretty certain you don't either what that really means. Juan? Wow, okay. <laughs> So, I, listening to both of you, I presume you both have information about brain circuitry and you know everything about the default no mode network and that you've already seen that 5-MeO changes uh, the dynamic configuration. Is that true? Absolutely. And how did you measure that? Uh, well, that's mostly, mostly at the level of, of connectivity. Uh, you see the, the hubs of, um, of what we consider the default mode network, not necessarily talking to each other in the same way and just becoming either more decentralized in the in their activity or yeah. so we, we don't we don't see that flow uh, being preserved so and then we see areas of the brain which are usually inhibited by the default mode network now coming more back to life um, and and you can do all this from just EEG data it's it's not too bad. You you can you can you, you can you can start making this kind of uh, assumptions with some level of of faith at least. But yeah. Okay. I, okay. That's to clarify. Uh, there's uh, different views about EEG, and there are um, <coughs> engineers. I guess they call themselves neuroengineers, who view the EEG. I'm going to use signals because it's all over the literature as just noise, <laughs> and um, EEG is just an epiphenomenon of volume conduction in the brain, and you know, so what? It's a lot more interesting than that. I mean, as a neurophysiologist, we have a very, very deep understanding of the sources of EEG, you know, synaptic potentials, local field potentials. I mean, there's like decades of research, animal studies, and now with humans, they're, they're doing electrocorticography big time in neurologic uh, interventions, neurosurgical, where they open up the skull. Epilepsy, yeah. yeah, epilepsy is one, and where they put arrays of electrodes. And I mean, I've been downloading papers every couple of months on exciting new information about brain dynamics, because you can record large areas of the cortex with very high fidelity. They're reporting 200 hertz activity in areas and stuff like that. So this is kind of the new direction. We have about five minutes. I uh, want to see if there's any questions uh, from, the, from the crowd here. You got, what's up, Doc, this morning? Hi, uh, I was wondering, uh, have you guys ha bumped into any issues in terms of getting peer review and, and publishing any of your work? Um, and how is that um, kind of affecting, you know, the research moving forward, but also um, the going through the peer review process? Because if you're doing guerrilla science, you can also go down tracks where you're not actually getting peer review <laughs> and then uh, on what you've been doing. I would say for me it's... Uh, because of the absence in the literature, uh, there's an eagerness and an excitement for, for things to come out and for journals to publish things that are, are novel on substances that don't have uh, a lot of data. And um, a lot of this kind of field work, you can go through an institutional IRB uh, and then sometimes you can do the work and then 
afterwards go to an IRB and say, hey, look, we collected all this, this data and would you approve it that it would be published? So for me, it's been, uh, it's been pretty open. Yeah. This, no? Okay. So yes, that's an issue. Uh, I don't have peer review because you have to do it through an institution and you have to, you know, jump lots of hoops. And my whole take on this is if you need to wait years to get approval and jump through many hoops, and this is very valuable, very interesting information, why delay it? So I was offered an opportunity to publish in a book called Advances in Psychology Research. And I jumped at that because uh, I wanted to get this information out. And it's made a difference. And I've gotten the people in London now interested. And you know, uh, they're pursuing DMT. And they have been for the last couple of years. So um, I got invited to submit to the Journal of Psychoactive Drugs because the editors are sympathetic to psychedelic research. But if you submit it to you know, Frontiers in Neuroscience or Journal of Neurophysiology or Nature, you're going to get a lot of pushback. And that's a problem. Um, if you were a part of the Psychedelic Brain Science Group in London, then those guys have the pass to publish in PNAS and in Nature and in all the top flight journals. Yeah, well, we definitely don't agree on the nature of the EEG, and that's fine, but I definitely agree with you on this peer review process, and it's a serious one. One of the core issues, I believe, is that there really is, there really is no, is this better? There really is no dialogue path between academia and us gorillas or the community, and there can't be. It's dangerous for them. They start hanging out with us and talking with us, and, and if we're doing X, Y, and Z, I mean, I've talked with serious academicians. They don't want to risk their reputation or their DEA license. So what's happened systemically is that we're, we're kind of isolated in this almost evolutionary cul-de-sac where our research is kind of fermenting and then dissolving and becoming moldy and useless, and then we become set because we think we know shit. Because there isn't that really active peer review process. So. You know, the landscape is definitely uh, slowly changing, which is good. But I, I personally have, um, my, my little trick is that I do a lot of this uh, work on animals, and, and, and scientists seem to care much less about animals. So they, they are far more um, open to publish uh, stuff as long as it's done on, on, uh, on, on, on smaller, weirder creatures. And Next question, yeah. Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff have suggested that uh, microtubules play a crucial role in uh, quantum computation as well as consciousness. And then more recently it suggested that what you're calling the epiphenomenon of uh, uh, EEGs, that it lies behind the EEG production. Have any of you done any research or know of research along this area with psychedelics? I'm a little confused. I know the orc uh, theory of Hameroff and Penrose, and microtubules do support quantum phenomena. Uh, whether that's the golden key to understanding consciousness is very disputed. <laughs> uh, I didn't quite understand the connection of EG to microtubules or quantum consciousness. What is the... They had suggested that uh, lying behind the EEGs that the microtubules are the source of the effects of EEGs. That's not correct, no. <coughs> no way. <laughs> okay. The source is the source. <laughs>